Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another segment of ARA's Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio, and it's my pleasure to be serving as your moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled GPR, What Can Squiggly Lines Really Mean to Us? Now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Matt Sue. Matt is the lead scientist and technical expert for all ground penetrating radar systems for ARA's Transportation and Infrastructure Division. He holds a bachelor's degree in geophysical engineering and a doctoral degree of philosophy in applied physics with an emphasis on planetary exploration using GPR. He's been working in a wide variety of systems over the past 15 years related to non-destructive evaluation, GPR testing, as well as others has extensive theoretical knowledge in electron, uh, electromagnets, electromagnetic simulations, and vast experience with single and dual channel short pulse radar systems, and a wide array of GPR, formerly known as 3D radar, for both highway and airfield applications. Matt has been with ARA uh, for a number of years. He works primarily in our airfield and pavement area and is our leading expert in GPR. Now, with that brief introduction, I could go on for a while. I would like to turn today's program over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Sue. Thank you, Jerry, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I've been working with GPR systems uh, for the last 15 years, and I see that this technology is not regarded as a primary tool within the payment industry despite proven and repeatable results. There are many reasons for GPR falling short of the praise it deserves, but hopefully we will reduce some of those reasons today. I've heard so many times someone making a remark about GPR that looking at those squiggly lines are giving them a headache. As a professional who is passionate about this technology, I realized that I would not be able to make people fond of GPR without putting myself into their shoes and embracing the word. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, the squiggly lines are going to hurt less. I intend to show how we speak squiggly lines language and what they can really tell us. Let's start with something out of the ordinary. When I was pursuing my PhD, I was working one of the coolest problems on Earth. Well, the problem was not really on Earth. It was on Moon. In 1972, NASA probed lunar soil using a radar called ALS. ALSE, which stands for Apollo Lunar Sounder Experiment, which is a form of GPR. Many years later, NASA planned a manned lunar mission in early 2000s with the intention to return to moon by 2020. This sounded so futuristic for a young geophysicist like me. So we proposed a project to NASA to look for a certain type of mineral in lunar soil using GPR to support future colonies. This was the beginning of my journey with GPR, and I think I did some very cool stuff while working on my PhD, and I learned a lot of GPR. I went to Hawaii to scan a terrestrial soil that resembles regolith using GPR. By the way, regolith is the proper term for lunar soil. Soon after graduation, I realized I would not be able to sell GPR to aliens, and with NASA's interest shifted to Mars, I decided to settle on a career path on Earth. In early 2010, it was not USA sending a GPR equipment spacecraft to moon. It was the Lunar Penetrating Radar, or LPR, that was designed to discover the shallower portions of the regolith. By looking at the LPR data collected on lunar soil, I can tell the official language for GPR is the squiggly line, whether it is on Earth or on moon. NASA brought many lunar samples during the 70s and studied them extensively for years. The samples were analyzed using different types of probes and laboratory equipment. To understand the squiggly lines from the Apollo Lunar Sounder experiment, NASA studied the electromagnetic properties of the regolith and determined the relationship between the density and the dielectric permittivity of the regolith. The device you see at the bottom of the screen, uses the same principle to determine the compaction of the freshly paved road. It is called a rolling density meter, or RDM for short, which uses 
squiggly lines to determine the compaction. So this is another great example of how the squiggly lines language is truly universal, whether you are on Moon or Earth. Working with GPI is very straightforward. To decipher the code inside the pavement black box, one needs to decipher the code inside the squiggly lines black box with the help of the cores and using a translator. The advantage of working with a translator is that you do not necessarily need to understand the language. It is our job at ARA to translate the data from squiggly lines to underground features. It is our job to crack the, what's inside the black boxes and help you communicate. We simply do that by understanding the language. To understand the language better, let's look at how GPR operates first. Ground penetrating radar is a type of radar, which is an acronym for radio detection and ranging. Radar was developed in the first half of the 20th century. And it is the same technology we use today to detect large metallic objects, such as an airplane. Operating principle of radar is simple. Transmitted radio waves return to radar bar after reflecting from an object. By measuring the elapsed time from transmission to reception, the distance to the object is measured in real time since the radio waves travel with the speed of light in air. In case of radar, the airplane represents a boundary within the homogeneous and isotropic airspace. It is the same principle that allows GPR to detect the thickness of layers or objects within the subsurface. Using GPR, the fundamental difference is that the radio waves are traveling in subsurface of unknown velocities and the waves are reflecting from the boundaries within or between the media. Sometimes these boundaries are distinctive and easily detectable, and sometimes they are very dim and not so easy to detect. So here's our first encounter with the squiggly lines, where we see a transmitted wave that reflected from the boundary between the two media that we see on the left. We see that the transmitted wave is significantly reduced in amplitude when it's reflected from that boundary. The strength of the reflection depends on the contrast between the properties of the media that make up the, the boundary. So when we speak squiggly lines, essentially we are speaking of boundaries, not layers. This concept is so simple yet so easily overlooked. When the antennas move, the transmission and the reception is repeated at every step along its path, and we simply connect the squiggly lines to determine a boundary in time, as you see on the right. This is called a GPR profile. A typical profile looks like Looks a little bit more complicated, but this is the basic principle. We use two types of GPR equipment with a variety of antennas for different needs to collect squiggly lines. The first one is the short pulse GPR system, which has two antennas operating at 900 megahertz and two gigahertz. This system combines the resolution and the depth of penetration under one umbrella for determining payment layer thicknesses while operating at traffic speeds. We use this system to detect the bound and unbound layer boundaries down to 50 inches below the surface. This combination is adequate for almost all payment structures. Our 21-channel wide array system is more suitable for scanning a large area per pass, which generates a 3D representation of the underground without the need of a grid. It has a variety of uses from detecting voids, V-bars to utilities, achieving great precision and can easily penetrate 8 to 12 feet below the surface for payment applications. Both of these systems gather positioning data from attached GPS receivers and thus can also be geospatially displayed. From this point forward, I will share some examples of the data that we collected and analyzed. Here's the typical case of the layer structure displaying discontinuities. We see two typical GPR profiles at the bottom which were collected with our short pulse GPR system. This data set belongs to the same payment structure. The top GPR profile shows a shallower portion of the structure down to approximately 20 inches below the surface, while the bottom profile displays a much deeper section. As shown here, squiggly lines always display multiple boundaries within a payment structure, even if you're not interested in all of them. For example, we may be interested in determining the overall thickness of the boundary by intermediate lifts of asphalt concrete will also appear. 
So how do we know which ones are the correct interfaces and which ones to disregard? And how do we know what materials are used? Cores come to rescue. Cores tell us about what depths we should expect to see material boundaries, as well as the material types. Comparing the time between the transmission and reception to a thickness of the core is a process called uh, calibration. The calibration not only helps us to understand the material properties, but also understand the structure that calibrating the data is possible in two different ways. The first one is using cores, and the second one is using the embedded software calibration procedures, which systems do internal calculations. Both methods are very effective. However, cores are a better choice if you are also interested in knowing the material types. GPS systems cannot determine the material type, except for a very few special cases. A common question is why we should rely on GPI instead of just taking core samples only. Cores represent a point in a payment structure that is often miles long and has transverse and longitudinal radiation, while GPI can connect the dots in between the cores. Cores can give you an accurate representation of that particular spot in that vast structure, while GPI can fill in the gaps that cores may not be able to represent. Coring is hard and requires a lot of work while trying to deal with live traffic and sometimes cores will not come out in one piece. Here's a 20 mile long payment profile that we were able to translate from the squeezy lines to a payment structure with the help of the cores. And you will see some variations from the coring graph to the payment layer structure graph. We can determine the uniform payment sections using GPRs. Shown here is a very simple tool that we developed for that purpose based on the material type and the layer thickness using ASHTO 1993 accumulative differences method. In this example, the tool is used to determine uniform sections of the overall thickness of the payment structure, which automatically lists the lengths to determine the average thickness of each material and the overall structure thickness of each section. In this example, we determined 10 sections with varying lengths and thicknesses. So GPI can help optimizing the coring efforts by suggesting core locations that are relevant to each section. This can provide operational and financial advantages. GPI by itself cannot determine the structural capacity of a payment structure but provides much needed thickness information for FWD analysis, which is an essential part of the payment design. Uniform sections acquired from GPR analysis can also be correlated to sections based on the FWD analysis to further define the section. We have seen some examples of utilizing our short cost data until this point. I will continue with the examples of our wide array system from Contour. But before, let's go over how a transverse utility under the road will appear in a wide array system. This will help us understand how we detect utilities. As the antenna approaches a linear and transverse feature, let's say a pipe, it will start to appear in every channel and will start to disappear as the antenna moves away from, as the pipe moves away from the antenna or the antenna moves away from the pipe. This creates hyperbolas in the GPR profile. By connecting the dots in time and in transverse and longitudinal offset, we determine the extent, the position, and the depth of the utilities. To detect utilities and other subsurface features, we use our wide array GPR system. The typical operation of this equipment is more advanced and complicated, but it provides a 3D representation of the underground. So it is generally easier to understand the squiggly lines generated with this system. The system employs multiple antennas to scan a swath, which is typically five feet wide, and sends a variety of frequencies ranging from 150 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. This results in a higher resolution and greater depth of penetration. We own and operate two different antennas with our wide array system. 
there are many use cases for these antennas, but generally speaking, we prefer to use the ground couple antenna to penetrate deeper and use the air launch antenna for achieving higher speeds. GPR is an excellent tool to detect underground defects or blend or in or below the payment structure. Here's an example showing voids that formed under the joints and started spreading underneath the slabs. This was a 20 mile long project and that we determined the, the void structure under the pavement uh, for that 20 miles. Here's another example of cracks in PCC and other deformation around the joints or voids under the slabs. Sometimes these cracks originate from the bottom of the pavement and GPR can detect these effectively. GPR can also be used for providing valuable information for the cause of faulting. In this case, GPR helps us to understand that voids formed under the slabs as the cause of the faulting and more information about the, and we were able to get more information about the structure. When one side of the road was reconstructed some time ago, separate baskets were used and the reconstructed lane was not tied to the older structure. So we determined this by examining the longitudinal joint as the older lane had 10 inch of rebar, which did not appear in the other lane. So it did not extend to the other lane. This was the indicator for us to know that these two structures were not connected when the second part of the road was built. GPR can be used to determine stripping as well. For this project, we initially collected data for a different purpose, but based on additional requests, we ran an analysis to determine a map of deteriorated areas within the structure with the help of the cores. Cores indicated a very poor state of the pavement at particular spots where we correlated to the corresponding locations in the squiggly lines. We determined that the absence of a clear boundary may be used to indicate the deterioration of the payment structure based on the confidence from the course and generated, and we generated a deterioration map based on this analysis. This is another project that we tried to determine the cause of large transverse cracks formed in the middle of the slabs. As seen from the image on the top left, we collected data when the pavement surface was wet. Generally speaking, presence of water creates issues for the squiggly lines in the form of noise. However, this worked in our favor in this particular example. We determined the length of the slabs as the primary contributor to cracking but also detected an area which is significantly brighter than the surrounding areas with increased noise. And this was a telltale to say uh, an indicative of excess water that you see at the bottom of the screen around 3.5 feet deep. Generally speaking, clay is regarded as not a desired material when working with squiggly lines. This statement may not be always true. The presence of clay may help us understand the road structure. Here's a use case where it was crucial for one of our projects. We determined the transverse road profile for four miles using our 3D radar system by tracing the, the clay. So that helped us understand the, the road bed and the areas that are prone to bathtubbing effect. GPR also helps us understand the details of the structure below the surface by allowing us taking horizontal slices of the pavement structure at desired depths. Here's an example where the surface is asphalt concrete and you cannot absolutely tell the structure beneath it. But the structure changed significantly an inch below the surface. We first detected the PCC underneath at approximately one inch deep, the traffic loops and the PCC joints. As we started dipping divers at six inches, 
we started to see transverse V bars and that some joints do not have them. Further down, we start observing patches from previous repairs and the trench where a utility at one and a half, one and one point eight feet deep lies within that trench. So GPI can effectively help us scan through the different depths of our payment structure for whatever the purpose is. And sometimes we get really lucky that we find a Google Earth image of a feature that we barely detected. Here's a large plastic pipe, seen right here, approximately three to four feet below the payment surface, showing up as a subtle but distinctive feature peaking between the squiggly lines. So the plastic pipes are generally harder to detect than the metallic ones as plastic is not a good reflector. But it is possible to detect plastic pipes as depending on the depth of the pipe and the depth of the pipe. Here we see an example of bridge of a bridge stake that we collected wider uh, ACPR data on it. Bridge uh, decks usually contain, uh, not usually, all the time contain a significant amount of uh, reinforcing steel, and metal is an excellent reflector for squiggly lines. This makes GPR an excellent choice for determining the concrete cover and deck thickness for bridge decks. In this example, we see that the deck has a uniform thickness across multiple layers of steel and connecting rods. Similar to bridge decks, approach slabs also contain significant amount of metal and GPR can tell us the turning condition of the reinforcing steel. In this example, we observe that the steel inside the approach slab is not flat, as shown in this area. And the concrete cover is significantly higher in the middle of the slab than the sides of the slab. This may be related to excessive compressive forces acting on the approach slab, or it may indicate a problem during the construction phase. And we also use our wide array system to detect uh, settlement at bridge decks. Here's a particular example from a bridge deck that we observed, uh, an approach slab that we observed uh, settlement, essential settlement from the tire marks that you can see on the left hand side corner. And we then our uh, 3D data analysis or wide array analysis collected data for, for the entire width of the deck and then analyzed the data to determine the cause of the settlement. Uh, however, we didn't necessarily find a void under the, the, uh, under the approach slab because the GPR data did not uh, display a certain type of feature that resembles a void. So this made us think, like maybe we're looking at something else, maybe a loose compaction. And then we requested two core samples at two different locations where we see a clear boundary and then where we see that boundary is trying getting that is disappearing. So at the end of the course, we did help of the course, of course, detected the thickness of the payment structure and also determined that the loose material under the uh, bridge deck, under the approach slab from one location to the other. GPI can also be used for contract compliance. Here's a typical of uh, typical example of detecting Z bars and tie bars at transverse and longitudinal joints. The depth, skew, tilt, and translation can all be determined by using GPI, as we see in this example. Here's an individual uh, tie bar at the longitudinal joint that seems to be adequately and properly suited, uh, seated inside the concrete structure. And the rest of the tie bars show that this structure 
has these bars equally spaced and also at a uniform depth, except maybe for this one, the one that we see here. So this one looks a little bit deeper than the other ones. So this indicates a possible problem at this location, but may not uh, warrant immediately a, a, a problem because the rest of the bars are in their respective places. Last but not least, we detected a large underground void that caused the collapse of the concrete slabs above. This caused a water source. This is caused by a water source near by carving a giant hole under the slab, which is 20 feet wide and 40 feet long. The collapse was approximately a foot deep, as we see in the middle of the slab. So this, uh, we can easily detect the V-bars in the middle of the concrete slab. And also, this is the bottom of the slab and the top of the slab, which was filled in with some other material within time. But GPI can effectively tell us the structure of a void. And it'll be helpful for detecting these features within the payment structure. So GPR is a very robust technology, but no technology is without limits, and understanding the limits is the key to speak squeaky lines. As we have discussed, there are many ways of utilizing GPR, but the examples that I showed you here today are not all inclusive. There are many other uses that fall beyond the scope of the payment industry. However, no matter what the use case is, the language of the GPR is the same. I'm leaving a few key points from our discussion today with the hope that this presentation helped you understand the capabilities of GPR a little bit better. And with that, thank you for watching and listening. I will now turn the webinar back over to Jerry for your questions. Next slide, please. So thank you, Matt. I, I promise I, I don't think I'll take any more Tylenol when I'm looking at GPR data from here on out. That was a fantastic presentation. We'll get to our Q&A period momentarily, but I wanted to, to share uh, with you some upcoming webinars and remind you of a couple of items. First of all, you see you can register for our webinars on uh, the address which is shown on slide 36. Uh, in February 22nd, which happens to be coincidentally the fourth year anniversary of ARA's monthly webinar, ARA Webinar Wednesday program, we'll be hearing on uh, tracking and bonding performance of commonly used tech coat materials and asphalt pavements. And I'd like to remind you that we, we try to mix up the topics among uh, our various uh, scientists and engineers that presentation in February will be presented by Dr. Abu Sifani, and all of our presenters are ARA employees. We have approximately 50 offices, about 1,750 personnel. On March the 8th, we'll be speaking uh, about communication roadblocks and how to break through them. Everybody can benefit from that, and my very good friend, Mr. Kevin Elliott, will be presenting that. Uh, all of our speakers are pretty entertaining as well as educational speakers. And then finally, the upcoming webinar on April 26th will be evaluating renewed nuclear explosive threats. And I'd ask you to focus on this slide and look at the diversity and the range of the presentation topics that will be provided to you. Now, I know a number of you have been submitting questions uh, through the program thus far. I want to remind you, for those that still haven't submitted questions, we'll be entertaining questions. And reminder, please, address the questions to the Q&A, and uh, excuse me, go to Q&A, not the chat room, and address them to both the host and the panelists. Next slide, please. So now we're going to enter into the Q&A period, and we've got a considerable amount of time. I have a number of questions I've already received. And Dr. Matt has been gracious. You see his email address on this particular slide. 
If you have a, a question that you don't think of during the, today's program and think of this evening at dinner or right before you go to bed, Matt has been gracious to receive at this email address any questions on this topic specifically for the next 24 hours. So let's, let's begin the program in terms of Q&A here. And the questions that we have, uh, first question, Matt, is from Ken. And Ken would like to know, what, are the, what is the recommended coring interval for a particular project? How do you approach that thinking? Um, it really depends on the length of the project, and it depends on the structures that we are observing, that we are examining. Uh, so usually, uh, what we would like to do is to get GPR out on that particular structure and have a uh, initial assessment of the structure so that we can uh, suggest some coring locations. As I showed in uh, one of my slides, we determined a uh, 10 different sections for that particular pavement, but uh, the cores uh, were twice the, the, the the length of the, the course that we require from that structure. So it really depends on the type of the structure. Okay, thank, thank you, Matt. We, uh, and um, I'll go along here. Uh, and if you have follow-up questions, I should also ask, we often receive those again, feel free to submit them, uh, or also, as I mentioned, uh, after the program, you're welcome within the next 24 hours to send that an email. So the next question, Matt, is from Bipod, and Bipod would like to know, did you notice a change in the, dielec the dielectric constant due to the presence of moisture in the AC layers, and how can we easily identify and get an idea about the presence of moisture? Yes, uh, there is a moisture uh, determine the moisture, and it also affects the dielectric constant of the pavement layers. So the, the material composition and the water content in soil effectively changes the dielectric properties. But uh, this, when we are dealing with uh, pavements or any type of GPR data, it is, uh, we are dealing with boundaries, not layers. So this is maybe a noise analysis can be helpful to determine the moisture content in a payment thickness, in, in a payment structure. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, were you finished, Matt? I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, next question is from Mary. And Mary would like to know, uh, what about plastic pipes and fiber optics? Can they be detected by GPR? Um, yes, plastic pipes can be detected, uh, but at the same time, uh, it depends on the, the the size of the pipe and the depth of the pipe. So generally speaking, large pipes uh, is easier to detect, but fiber optic cables without a tracer uh, wire, and even sometimes with the with the with a tracer wire, is not easy to detect because. Uh, that represents a very small boundary in a very large structure. So uh, it is usually a hit or miss situation. Okay. Um, next question is from Alice. And Alice would like to know, when you refer to similar materials to produce a weak boundary, are you speaking about a physical boundary? Um, actually, no. So when we are speaking of, you know, GPR, it detects boundaries, but GPR requires a boundary to have an adequate contrast that makes up the, uh, from the materials that make up the boundary. So a physical boundary may exist, but that doesn't necessarily turn that GPR will be able to detect it. That is based on the electromagnetic properties that make up that boundary. So, okay, and the next question, and if I mispronounce your first name, Tawaka, is uh, asking a 
question. In urban environments and cities, there are several utilities within very narrow spacing. How effective is GPR as a method in such an environment? Um, GPR would be a very effective choice uh, for that because the the transverse uh, resolution for GPR is approximately, especially for the 3D data, it is a, uh, approximately three inches or a little below the three inches. But we can collect data up to an inch at per uh, along the road. So we can collect and uh, determine the locations of the utilities with great resolution. So. So a follow-up question along the same lines of uh, tightly spaced, uh, closely spaced utilities. Should GPR in these situations be complemented by other methods? Um, I, I would say depending on the type of the utility, like as far as I know, we are not, as the industry, we are not able to detect plastic pipes uh, with great accuracy. So yes, sometimes uh, you know using multiple methods to detect utilities is more suitable than just doing it with GPR. But on this, at the same time, uh, GPR is one of the uh, one of the uh, high resolution and effective tools to for detecting utilities. Okay. The next question is from Jamal and. He would like to know, how do you determine when to use which equipment and by that either a 2D system or a 3D system? That really depends on the, the need of the project. So if we are trying to locate the utility, obviously we would like to see the extent, the depth, and the position of the utility. So we definitely use uh, 3D radar or wide array system for that purpose. And sometimes uh, we just need to determine the payment thicknesses. And then that's the, the, the time that we know that maybe using wide array system may not be suitable for, for that purpose or maybe an overkill for that purpose, depending on the type of the project. So it really depends on uh, what we would like to achieve and the project needs. Okay, now the next question is from Bipa again, and um, this question has to do with uh, your opinion regarding what would be your interpretation? If through GPR you observe multiple layers within the asphalt concrete layers. Jerry, would you mind repeating the question one more time? No, absolutely not. So the question is, what would be your interpretation if through GPR, you observe multiple layers within the AC layers. Um, it, this one is a little hard to say because it really depends on the data. So, you know, if you see multiple uh, boundaries, that means uh, if this is an AC pavement, uh, that this probably is indicative of multiple lifts, but in, in a PCC payment, I would say, I mean, I, it needs, I need to really need to see the data without, you know, like giving a, anything, a false representation of the data, but, you know, uh, I'm not really sure I need to see the data. No, that, that's a fair response. I would agree with that. And then a uh, final question I have from uh, Elena is, is, Matt, is it possible to determine material quantities for a project using GPR? Yes, uh, I would say yes to that, uh, especially, uh, you know, with the wide array systems, since instead of uh, using a line, we are determining the, the payment thicknesses and, you know, other features within a 3D representation of the underground. So we can determine the payment thicknesses, again, with the help of the I mean, the, the material quantities are based on the payment thicknesses, again, with the help of the cores. Okay. Uh, and those are all the questions I'm seeing currently. I want to remind everybody, if you think of a question uh, and, and the program ends and we have a, just a few more comments for you, please feel free to reach out to Pat at the email address that you see on this slide. 
Finally, a bit of a commercial uh, from ARA. It's a fantastic company. I'm on my third career, retired from both the federal government and the National Academy of Sciences, and my 10th year at ARA. We always strive to hire the best and the brightest, and one of our mottos is science and engineering is for fun and profit. We have a number of exciting opportunities throughout the United States, and if you're interested in employment opportunities, specifically with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, that's one of our six, six business sectors, transportation and infrastructure, please send a brief resume to the address you, you see on this slide. I'd like to remind you all, uh, and thank you all, including Matt, and especially Matt, for presenting today's program. May God bless you. Have a great day.